Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day to you. This is Dr. Gaurav Agnihotri and today I am going to give a talk on the mammary gland. The human mammary gland is an exocrine gland. Many of you will be surprised to know that it is a modified sweat gland and it is made up of clusters of alveoli or fluid filled hollow spaces lined by cuboidal cells which secrete milk. These clusters are lined by myoepithelial cells. The mammary gland is rudimentary in males, while in the females it develops in size, particularly after puberty due to the effect of estrogen. So the mammary gland or the breast is important. Why is it important? Because breast cancer is the most cons common cancer in women worldwide. It is the number one cancer in women worldwide. And overall if we see, including both the sexes, it is the second most common cancer overall. So a knowledge of the breast anatomy is very important. Now the breast cancer may manifest as a retracted nipple or dimpling of the skin or any other change in the breast region like bleeding or ulceration. So awareness regarding this condition is very important. Now, we talk about the situation and extent of the breast. So when we talk about the situation and extent, there is a vertical extent and there is a horizontal extent. Vertically, the breast extends from the second rib to the sixth rib and horizontally, it extends from the outer border of the sternum to the mid axillary line. The anterior fold of axilla is this one, while the posterior fold of axilla is lying posteriorly. So in between is the mid axillary line. So from the lateral border of the sternum to the mid axillary line is the lateral extent of the human breast. Now the breast can be divided into four quadrants. They are the upper lateral quadrant, the lower lateral quadrant, upper medial quadrant and lower medial quadrant. Out of these quadrants, the upper lateral quadrant, it gives an extension which passes through the deep fascia and goes into the axilla. That is called the axillary tail of Spence. It is marked by uh, a in the figure shown in the diagram. So we have the four quadrants marked by 1, 2, 3 and 4 and the axillary tail of Spence marked by A in the figure. Now we come to the relations of the breast. The breast lies in the superficial region of the pectoral, superficial fascia of the pectoral region. So it has got deep relations. Deep to the breast lies the deep fascia which is referred to as the pectoral fascia. Still deep to it are the three muscles and these muscles are the pectoralis major and parts of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen and the serratus anterior. Now what is the structure of the breast? The breast is essentially composed of three components. The three components are skin, parenchyma and stroma. Skin covers the breast all around. Parenchyma is a glandular tissue which secretes milk. Now the skin which is covering the breast, it shows an eversion. It shows a conical projection called the nipple around which is the pigmented area called the areola. The glandular tissue is made up of clusters of alveoli which drain into the lactiferous duct. 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts, they pierce the nipple. And near its termination, each lactiferous duct shows a dilatation that is called the lactiferous sinus. In this figure, we are seeing the alveoli which are marked by B the lactiferous duct is showing a dilatation which is marked by A and the lactiferous duct is marked by C. Now the stroma of the breast is of two types, fibrous stroma and fatty stroma. Fibrous stroma, it is uh, known as ligament of Cooper. These are the fibrous strands which are connecting the skin. We can say they are anchoring the skin to the deep fascia or the pectoral fascia. 
The fatty stroma is forming the bulk of the gland. It is distributed all over the breast except beneath the nipple and the areola. So there are three components of the breast, skin, the parenchyma or the glandular tissue and the stroma, which is divided into fibrous stroma and fatty stroma. Now nerve incisions of breast, the incisions of breast are usually made radially because, because we want to avoid cutting the lactiferous ducts. Now the nerve supply of the breast is very important. The nerve supply is by the anterior and lateral cutaneous branches of the fourth to sixth intercostal nerves. These are responsible to sens for sensory sensations from the breast. But milk secretion, one must always remember, is not controlled by these nerves. Milk secretion is controlled by the hormone which is secreted by the anterior pituitary called the prolactin. The breast is a very vascular organ and it has a rich blood supply. Now in this figure, 1, 2 and 3, they are showing the parts of the axillary artery and D is the pectoralis minor muscle. So the first part of axillary artery gives one branch, superior thoracic artery, second part gives two branches, acromiothoracic and lateral thoracic branches. So superior thoracic, acromiothoracic and lateral thoracic branches of the axillary artery, they supply the breast. Also the perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery, they supply the breast. So here we can say, see in this figure, uh, double A shows the axillary artery, S is the superior thoracic artery, A is the acromiothoracic artery and L is the lateral thoracic artery. All these are branches of the axillary artery. ITA is showing the perforating branches of internal thoracic artery and IA is showing the lateral branches of posterior intercostal arteries. So the breast has got a very rich blood supply. The veins, they follow the arteries. The veins for, form an anastomotic, anastomotic circle deep to the nipple and uh, the thing which is important regarding the venous drainage is that the venous uh, drainage provides a pathway via which metastasis can take place from the breast to the spine and from the spine to the human brain. As you can see in the figure, plexus, the venous plexus, blood can go and so metastasis can take place to the C which are the intercostal veins and from there to the azygous vein which is B and from there to the internal vertebral venous plexus lying within the vertebra that is the Bateson's plexus, valveless channels are there and from there again the retrograde spread of cancer can take place to the human brain. So this pathway every doctor and every clinician must keep in mind. A venous pathway which mediates the spread of breast cancer from the breast to the spinal region and from there to the brain. Carcinoma of the breast definitely spreads by lymphatics. 75% of the lymph from the breast is drained by the axillary lymph nodes. So there are two organs in our body whose carcinoma spreads by lymphatics, very important. Uh, there are many organs but these two are very important. One is the breast, other is the stomach. 75% of lymph from the breast drains into the axillary lymph nodes. The most important in the axillary group is the anterior group of lymph nodes which lies in relation to the anterior fold of axilla. Then we have the posterior group of lymph nodes which lies in relation to the posterior fold of axilla. We have the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes lying in relation to the upper part of humerus. We have the central group of lymph nodes lying in the fat of the axilla and then we have the apical group of lymph nodes lying below the clavicle. So there are five groups of axillary lymph nodes out of which the most important one is the anterior group of lymph nodes. 75% of the lymph from the breast drains into the anterior group of lymph nodes and the axillary lymph nodes. So lymph from the breast will go to the anterior and posterior group of lymph nodes and from there to the central and lateral group of lymph nodes and from there to the apical group of lymph nodes. Invariably, in cases of breast cancer, the lymph nodes are enlarged. So if the spread has taken place to the lymph nodes, one must make it a point to palpate for the presence of lymph nodes if a lump is present in the breast. 75% of the lymph drains into the axillary lymph nodes and this diagram here is showing all the uh, axillary lymph nodes. 
Now, F is showing the parasternal lymph nodes. 20% of the lymph from the breast drains into the parasternal lymph nodes. And 5% is going to drain to another group. That is called the posterior intercostal lymph node. So this figure here is showing all the three groups. Axillary group, which is draining 75% of the lymph from the breast. Parasternal, which is draining 20% of the lymph from the breast. And the posterior intercostal, which is draining 5% of lymph from the breast. So lymphatic spread takes place for breast cancer. Now, Metastasis can also take place to some other lymph nodes like the deltopectoral lymph nodes and the cephalic lymph nodes. There is a subareolar plexus of SAPE which has been described and this is a lymphatic plexus present in relation to the breast. When we talk of the lymphatics of the breast, we have to classify them as superficial lymphatics and deep lymphatics. Superficial lymphatics are those which will drain the skin of the breast except the nipple and the areola. While the deep lymphatics, they will drain the parenchyma of the breast, they also drain the nipple and the areola. Now there are communications between the superficial lymphatics of the right side and the left side and so this can be responsible for spread of breast cancer from one breast to the other. And the superficial lymphatics of the breast are also communicating with the superficial lymphatics of the abdomen. So the breast can, breast cancer can spread from one breast to the abdomen also through the superficial lymphatics. So this is showing you the blue colored is the subareolar plexus of SAPE and this figure is showing you how uh, lymphatic channels from the subareolar plexus of SAPE are moving on to A that is the anterior group of axillary lymph nodes. Now we come to the development of the breast. This development of the breast is important because it explains how uh, the polythelia or polymastia may occur and at what sites they can occur and it also provides a correlation between the milk secreting parts of human beings and animals. Now the breast develops from an ectodermal ridge and this ectodermal ridge or the Schultz line uh, extends from the axilla to the groin. Subsequently it disappears, it remains only in the pectoral region and in that particular region uh, it develops, this ectodermal ridge develops a pit and in that particular pit the buds develop and these buds they subsequently form the lobes of the breast. At the site of the original pit the nipple is everted and this is how the breast is formed. So if during development this line of Schultz fails to disappear in some area it will lead to formation of breasts in that area and this is responsible for the genesis of polymastia and polythelia also. The gland, the breast is ectodermal while the stroma is mesodermal in origin. So there are different quadrants of the breast as I have mentioned earlier also. This particular figure is showing the incidence of breast cancer in the different quadrants. As you can see, the upper and outer quadrant is the area where maximum incidence of breast cancer takes place, 50%. 18% of breast cancer is reported around the nipple. Now what is the anatomical basis of uh, folding of the skin, dimpling of the nipple in case of breast cancer? See if the metastasis, if the breast cancer is involving the ligaments of Cooper, then these ligaments of Cooper they get tightened and because of their tightening they get shortened and because of their shortening they manifest as dimpling of the skin or puckering of the skin. If the metastasis or the breast cancer cells are involving the lactiferous ducts, then the lactiferous ducts undergo fibrosis and they result in retraction of the nipple. So this is the genesis of the physical manifestations of breast cancer that is the retraction of the nipple, dimpling of the skin or folding of the skin. So I read, infiltration of lactiferous ducts and their con consequent fibrosis can cause retraction of the nipple. If there is obstruction of the lymphatic vessels by the cancer cells, that will lead to a swollen breast, what is referred to as a PUD orange appearance of the breast. So obstruction of superficial lymphatic vessels by cancer cells can produce edema and this is, this is called the PUD orange appearance of the breast. Now what are the sites to which metastasis of breast can take place? As I have already mentioned earlier, there is a venous pathway by which 
breast cancer can spread to the vertebra and from there to the brain? Well, the breast cancer can spread from one breast to the other via lymphatics. It can spread from breast to the abdomen and liver via superficial lymphatics or the breast cells may just, the metastatic cells may just drop as secondaries to produce uh, manifestations in the pelvic region, what is referred to as the Krukenberg's tumor of the ovary. Breast metastasis can take place to the bones. They can cause, it can cause weakening of the bones, what is referred to as osteoporosis. So this condition needs to be contained. The breast cancer needs to be contained as quickly as possible and for that it needs to be detected as quickly as possible. Now, women over 20, they are advised do a physical self-examination of the breast once a month and look for any of the signs mentioned in this slide. They are advised to look for a lump, dimpling of skin, change in color or texture of skin, change in how the nipple looks. So all these features can indicate the existence of breast cancer. And as I mentioned earlier, early diagnosis indicates good prognosis. So ladies above 20 are advised to have a self-examination of the breast once a month at least after they attain the age of 20. So this self-examination pattern, the search pattern can be any, one can move in lines, one can move in circles, one can move in the form of wedges. All the four quadrants should be palpated with the palm of the hand and one should look for the existence of a lump. And one should also raise the arms to feel the lymph nodes in the axilla because I mentioned earlier, lymphatics from the breast, they go to the lymph nodes and lymph nodes will get affected quite quickly after the onset of breast cancer. So one must try to detect a lump or a enlarged lymph node if it exists so that early diagnosis and treatment can be done and the life of the person can be saved. Now the diagnostic techniques are also important. If there is a lump in the breast or in the axillary region, one can go for a mammogram to confirm the diagnosis. Fine needle aspiration cytology also can be done. In this figure, A is showing the syringe, B is the ultrasound and C are the fluid filled cysts. So doing the fine needle aspiration cytology, what is referred to as FNAC, the fluid can be taken out and examined. So I would like to conclude by saying that the detailed knowledge of the anatomy of the breast is imperative to understand the clinical manifestations and provide effective and adequate treatment. Till the next time I meet, this is Dr. Gaurav signing off. Thank you, regards and namaste.